Trevor, uh, welcome very much. I'm very happy that you found time to come to, to our club. Um, your, the floor is yours. Well, thank, thank you for inviting me. Oh, we're, it's always so wonderful to come here to Bond. It's been a few years. Four, four years, yes. Four years already. Four years. Well, thank you. And um, I'm going to talk about uh, is there a role for a tinfoil hat in PPPM? And I don't have a monitor in front of me. <laughs> and I can't see the screen behind me, so please bear with me here. <laughs> Okay. Well, as you know, we've been particularly interested in chronic disease and particularly the pathogenesis of chronic disease. And uh, about a decade ago, um, I wrote some papers and uh, started some research on the persisters, the uh, microbes that persist in the human body and which could potentially cause disease. Now, of course, now we know that the um, microbiome is extensive, that there are thousands of species that persist uh, in and on the human body. Um, what I'm most interested in are not the genes in the GI tract, not the microbes in the GI tract. I'm interested in the microbes in the tissues, in the tissues of the body, because those are the ones in the nucleated cells of the tissues uh, which can cause chronic disease. If we look at some of the um, uh, most likely candidates, uh, EBV is the obvious one. You can search in Pub PubMed for any diagnosis, basically any chronic diagnosis, and find a paper blaming EBV for the particular disease. It's very commonly found uh, in patients with chronic disease, with compromised immune systems. Um, and uh, what I noticed was that it downregulates a um, nuclear receptor, the VDR nuclear receptor, significantly, very significantly, more than tenfold in lymphoblastoid cell lines. Um, and I, and I, I figured there might be a reason for that. Maybe that's the mechanism of persistence. Then when I started looking at the other microbes, Mycobacterium tuberculosis, Aspergillus, Borrelia, Chlamydia, hepatitis C virus, cytomegalovirus, and of course EBV again. Um, they all act by knocking down expression uh, by the VDR. And the reason for this has turned out to be that the VDR is responsible for a key uh, endogenous defense of the cell. Uh, Catholicidin antimicrobials um, are expressed uniquely by the VDR. Um, alpha defensins and beta defensins are also partially expressed by the VDR. So in a way VDR is at the heart of innate immunity because if a microbe can knock down the VDR then it has certainly overcome the barrier of catholicidin to its persistence. To persist inside the cells the microbiome dis disables VDR expression of those key antimicrobials. And I went searching for a drug that we could retarget, preferably, or um, syn synthesize if necessary, but we were able to retarget a drug um, that was uh, designed as an angiotensin receptor blocker, but actually when the dosage is changed uh, to make it a more frequent dosing, it actually targets the VDR and acts as a very effective partial agonist. Now when the VDR is reactivated uh, with this drug, Olmosartan, then you have immunostimulation. And immunostimulation is very different from immunosuppression. All of you would know immunosuppression, you've seen it. When you give cortisol or prednisone to a patient, then you know pretty well that it works. It works over a whole range of, of diseases. The surprise we found was that immunostimulation works over a whole range of diagnoses as well. And we put some of them together here. We uh, have something like uh, 120 uh, discrete diagnoses in at least five of the members of our cohort. Uh, of course, there's a mixture of diagnoses. Most members of the cohort have more than one 
uh, diagnosis because most of them are very ill. And we put them together um, in our paper for uh, autoimmune disease and the human metagenome. That was a chapter. Um, and um, w we tried to draw a chart of the relationships, particularly the unusual ones. Like here, schizophrenia turns out to be fairly frequently related with cardiac disease. And asthma is frequently related with rheumatoid arthritis. That's not a surprise. And both types of diabetes, uh, also not really a surprise. But the interrelationships between all these diseases surely must be telling us something. We know that prednisone has effect on them all. Well, what we've been finding over the last decade is that immunostimulation also has a very wide effect. And we were really tickled pink when um, Discovery Medicine, which is edited by Noel Rose of Johns Hopkins, um, decided to feature our uh, network on the uh, disease network on the, on the front cover of the journal where they published our most recent paper, almost our most recent paper. Now, in order to retarget that drug, we had to do some pretty clever in silico work. And we used a technique called molecular dynamics. Molecular dynamics doesn't just look at it as a, a molecule, as a whole lot of uh, sticks and, and uh, knobs and, and dots. It actually, restart the video, can you? It, it actually plots the position of each atom as a function of time. And you can see the atoms are moving around. You can't see most of the atoms in the VDR because the VDR is shown as helices. The, uh, um, the nucleic acids are shown as uh, helices. But I want to look at the red ones and, and see the red ones, which are the oxygens. They're moving. Red ones are highly charged. Oxygens are highly charged. Those hydrogen bonds are changing all the time. And it occurred to me that if you've got highly charged atoms moving around, you've got waves, by definition, moving charges. And when I did an analysis of the hydrogen bonds that were formed between the ligand, the VDR receptor, and the waters which are in the, um, in the simulation, then depending on where we started the ligand uh, in the binding pocket, it uh, generally took a while to settle into uh, homeostasis. So in this case, where we had placed it, gave a total of five hydrogen bonds approximately, and over a period of time, that rose to around uh, an average of seven or eight hydrogen bonds. Not necessarily the same hydrogen bonds. These are changing all the time. You saw those um, uh, atoms moving, the oxygen atoms moving around rather vigorously. But I looked at that and I said, wait. I said, that's unstable. Not only have you got the instability here, but you also have traces of instability which can be seen here further on through the, uh, through the model, uh, molecule settling down. And when I did an FFT to find out what frequencies were dominant in the molecular motions, we found 6 gigahertz, 13 gigahertz, 20 gigahertz, and 33 gigahertz. And we have sitting up on the roof here a Wi-Fi access point which is radiating at 5.8 gigahertz. The 6 gigahertz is plus or minus 1.3 gigahertz because I can't, um, I can't get it more accurate than that with the, um, with the number of points in the emulation. But it's certainly in the same range as what we are already using in modern technology. So the question is, is it possible that waves could affect biology? Because everybody knows that if you've got ionizing radiation, sure, it's got enough energy, a few electron volts here or there will knock, knock the atom into a new orbit. What, what about non-ionizing radiation? <clears throat> well, this is a very good paper, which points out that not only is the molecule I was looking at uh, unstable, but many molecules, uh, ligand and uh, receptor,
protein ligand binding in solution. Many of the molecules are unstable. And further, uh, Vate down here actually proposed that quantum criticality, this criticality, the underdamped, um, the molecules living on the edge, if you like, uh, could actually be at the uh, origin of life that that stochastic, semi-stochastic uh, interaction that is then possible with the waves being generated and the waves being received could possibly be part of the um, mosaic that we see whenever we get down deep enough in biology that makes it look very, very complex. <clears throat> so I'd met this gentleman in China um, in 2010, um, a German academic, an engineering academic, uh, Prof. Constantin Meyer, and he'd been doing some work with something he called scalar velen, uh, which is a different, it's a longitudinal electromagnetic wave, a little bit different from normal transverse waves such as that access point would use. And uh, they were using them in spas in Germany, this is one of the spas. And I, I looked at it, I replicated his uh, equipment, um, well, not his equipment, uh, but I replicated his technology, checked it out, and then we shrank it down to a little circuit board, which has got two capacitive radiators and emits the capacitive waves, such as those which he calls scalar velen. And we made 75 of these and sent them out to volunteers from the cohort, and we said, what do they do? Because they shouldn't do anything. If I go back to the other slide, you can see the power level being used is 25 nanowatts, about minus 100 dBm, way below the power of that uh, Wi-Fi access point, a thousand times less than the power of that Wi-Fi access point. And there should be no effect whatsoever, but the patients reported all sorts of effects ranging from induction of mania to reduction of idiopathic pain. Very few replied, no effect. Well, of course, the problem is here you've got subjective evaluation by very sick people who would desperately like for there to be um, an improvement, the nocebo effect. You also have the placebo effect. And trying to confound it out, we decided on balance, yeah, it looked as though um, people who are ill can actually sense these very low levels of radiation. So I said to myself, well, that's interesting because the region, that, the region of sensitivity is down here. Let me explain the graph. This graph is a graph of the um, power density of GSM cellular radio signals in Germany cumulatively across the population. So you've got a percentile here, 10% have levels below this minus 50 dBm, and then 90% have levels above it here. So you've got power density, power intensity up there, logarithmic scale, each of these is a factor of 10, and then the percentiles across the, the base. Now, this region of sensitivity was much, much lower than uh, the, the normal electrosmog would be at. And in particular, this minus 50 dBm has been designated in the past as being the lowest level of biological interest. So I thought, well, how can I test this? And I thought of a tinfoil hat. So this is a modern tinfoil hat. It's actually made out of uh, a fabric which has silver threads interspersed with bamboo threads. You can see them up here. Bamboo because many of these people are very sensitive to uh, fabrics. And you know, it just basically goes on, covers, covers the face and the brain stem. Particularly the brain stem we found was important. And a little bit of Velcro to stop it coming off. <clears throat> and we uh, set these out and we asked the volunteers to wear them for four hours one day, during the day, and once while sleeping. Preferably for four hours if you can make it. As I said, the brainstem's very important. Uh, most of us are aware 
of this recent paper in Nature which points out that the uh, lymphoid glands uh, drain from the brain drain into that uh, base of the neck. <clears throat> and we were really surprised by the results. We asked them to report no effect, weak effect, definite effect and strong effect and to describe those effects and to describe those effects as a function of time. Keep describing them for weeks. We've had a number of them that have been describing them for months, their daily experience with and without the hat. Many wear it at work uh, and, uh, and many, many wear it for, for sleeping. Once again, we have tremendous range of, um, uh, of uh, symptoms reported from induction of mania to remission of fibromyalgia pain. And I know, I have personal experience of the induction of mania because the, the nurse that uh, was trying it um, uh, wrote to me, wrote an email to me saying, oh, it's wonderful, oh, it's great. And I could read mania dripping out of every line. <laughs> it, 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 it's the, the effect was amazing. And yet there shouldn't have been any effect because... All the thing is, is a bit of fabric. There's no battery. There's no power. No, all it is is a, a shield. So the inference is that the um, electrosmog around these people, both within the house and external sources such as cell towers, was affecting the symptoms in such a way that when you reduce uh, the electrosmog, particularly the, the microwave electrosmog, um, because the ge geometry of the hat is significant. Um, then it changes their symptoms. So how do we explain the um, induction of mania? Why would shielding somebody's brain from a non-biological uh, source, electrosmog, make them worse? Well, it turned out that what's actually happening is the immune system is being t part, part of the immune system. And the immune system is, is not just two bits, adaptive and innate. It's lots of little bits that add up to what we call adaptive and innate. And part of the immune system was being shut down by relatively low levels of signal. Um, and when the um, electrosmog is removed, that immune system reactivates. And if the patients have an immune disease, that can exacerbate the immune disease through a phenomenon known as immunopathology. And we discovered that before because we were using an immunostimulatory therapy. So the patients were aware uh, that sometimes the symptoms get worse before they get better. This is the ANA titer, antibody titer for a rheumatoid arthritis patient. Uh, this is the VASD, the Bath ankylosing spondylitis disease activity index for an ankylosing spondylitis patient. And in both cases, the disease and the symptoms got worse before they started to get better, and they were seeing the same thing here, which means that immune, immune suppression was the only, um, only thing that fitted the model that we were seeing. So when we plot it back on that graph, we find that 97% of the German population if the graph's accurate, and it's good enough, 97% uh, of the population is uh, at a level where we know the immune system is being affected. And only about 3% of the population live in an immune-neutral region. But the really interesting thing to me is that you can get very good smartphone signals Five bars receive signal strength indication, in fact, at this level here, right in the middle of the green region. You know, it's quite compatible with biology if you don't build these really high-powered towers putting out a lot more signal than you need to put out just to get into that last little bedroom um, to, uh, to give them TV while they're in bed or something. Um, so so it, the take-home points are Firstly, if you're treating chronically ill patients, probably some of the drugs which don't seem to be responding properly, uh, or the patients don't seem to be responding properly to drugs, or other symptoms that you just can't pin down, 
may very well be due to the cell tower that just got built 100 feet away from their bedroom. Um, the second take home point is that mobile phones can uh, get five bar signals in the green region. Man and technology can coexist. These access points are in fact very close to the green region, minus 55 to minus 60, which is down in this region here. And I was very impressed, in fact, when I <laughs> measured that when I arrived uh, at the university. It's just a matter of deploying our technology more intelligently. That is the message that I want to get through. Yes, biology can be affected by waves, apparently. Very easy to check. I'll send, the, uh, send some of these to any of you that want to uh, replicate our work. Um, and uh, that it's possible to avoid many of those problems if we're a bit more intelligent with our deployment of this technology. Thank you. <laughs>